So um, in the previous lecture, it was a um, uh, theoretical introduction uh, uh, about uh, beyond the standard uh, model physics. Um, I reminded a lot some details about the standard model and then um, I went into uh, grand unification. I didn't have time, unfortunately, to detail um, extra dimension. And then I spoke about supersymmetry and I went on to um, superstring. And somehow superstring combines all the ideas about uh, grand unification, extra dimension, and supersymmetry. Uh, today, we will discuss um, in a few examples, because it's just too large to cover in one hour, um, experimental uh, searches about these ideas. So the outline is simply two parts. Uh, one of the DSM searches that you can do at accelerator facilities, and uh, the second part uh, where you do not use accelerators. So uh, the first part at accelerators, first we will discuss about uh, colliders and I will go back. So I will just describe two colliders, uh, one E plus E minus lab and one LHC. They are all at CERN or were, and th these are the two largest uh, collider ever built. So the LEP um, uh, era was between 1989 and 2001, and the LHC uh, really started uh, a data co um, PP collision in 2009, and is supposed to be around up until 2035 or something. So let's start with LEP. So it's a 27 kilometer uh, tunnel, um, uh, uh, almost completely circular, which is buried 100 meters underground at the switch French border. Um, it has essentially two big phases, sorry. For the first phase, um, uh, the collision were centered around the Z peak and there it was a, a Z factory to, to really study that in detail. And then um, in lab two, uh, the energy were, was raised up first at the um, uh, 2W uh, threshold to also study the W boson with some precision and then to push uh, as much as they could with their um, RF cavities, the energy up to 209 GeV for the searches, and at that time, the Higgs boson was uh, not discovered. So uh, people, including myself, for example, were looking for the Higgs boson in this type of experiment. Uh, here, there is a sketch of a, a RF cavity. And just for people who don't know, uh, the LEP or the LHC is not completely circular. The acceleration of the particle is not everywhere, by the way. Um, in, the, in the magnets that you have, you have straight sections where you actually really accelerate the particle. And then you have dipoles uh, just to maintain that in the, in, in the circle and uh, focusing magnets, which are quadrupoles, sexopoles, etc. But the, the real acceleration is done in straight sections. Um, just, and, and there is also a, a, a photograph to show you um, uh, some kind of drawing on the map of the SPS and the LHC compared to the size of the uh, CERN, uh, uh, no, sorry, the Geneva airport. Okay, so um, a, at LEP, um, the, the, the beam was not uh, continuous. It was made of bunches and between two collisions, uh, the, the elapsed time was of the order of 300 nanoseconds. The typical uh, uh, instantaneous luminosity was 10 to the 31 or 10 to the 32 per centimeter squared and per second. There was a nice measurement of the, the energy. So the spread was uh, down to uh, one, uh, 10 to the minus four. And there was um, a, a, a small crossing angle. Here I, I um, uh, document the uh, integrated luminosity that was delivered at different center of mass energy during lab two. I was working in the L3 experiment and these were the different 
um, energy that were uh, uh, scanned somehow by the machine and data were taken there. Okay, at LEP, if you see on the left-hand side, there were four experiments, Aleph, Delphi, L3, and Opel, uh, for um, uh, general purpose uh, experiment. I make a, a slight zoom on the L3 experiment. You have uh, um, a big tube that supports the, uh, the vacuum tube for the, for the beam. And at the center, you have tracking detectors uh, calorimeters. Uh, in particular, there was a, a very nice uh, crystal calorimeter for the EM part in, in this uh, L3 experiment, then a hadron calorimeter, and outside of that you have a muon spectrometer. And you have uh, two, two magnetic fields, one in the center, a solenoid uh, of about alpha tesla, and a toroid uh, in the external part of a bit more than than one Tesla. I show you, I won't detail, but a few performances uh, with a different resolution for the tracking, the calorimetry, and you can see, for example, an, an excellent uh, uh, energy resolution for the EM calorimeter, thanks to the crystal that are displayed here. It was BGO crystal, so uh, Bismuth Germanat, um, and it was uh, very uh, well performing. And then also some resolutions for the, for the movies. Um, on the other end, uh, the, se the, the second uh, collider I want to describe is the LHC. It can collide uh, protons or, or also lead ions. It was made in the same tunnel as the lab. The lab was dismantled and uh, the, the LHC machine was built afterward. It has also a good uh, energy resolution, but of course it's uh, much easier to, to do with uh, for protons because they radiate less than the electrons and um, the crossing angle is, is very small. Uh, here you have a table of all the run that were already taken, so run one and run two, and also the, the features of run three that you're about to start in uh, less than one year now. Um, and you can see that compared to LED, the luminosity has increased, and especially the energy in the center of mass has, uh, has strongly increased. On the bottom, you have the timeline. And right now, uh, we are uh, during this uh, long shutdown two, and we're supposed to resume with uh, data taking with the run three next year, as I mentioned. And after um, the, uh, the long shutdown three, there will be two more runs, run four and run five at very high luminosity. Uh, so the goal uh, after run three is to accumulate 300 uh, inverse femtobarn of data and gain a, an order of magnitude uh, with that in the so-called program, which is iLUNI LHC. Here on uh, the right, I show you Yes. So, sorry. Um, just for the run three, the date, the years are. Uh, I think there is a typo, right? Uh, from two thousand twenty-one to two thousand twenty-three. Yes, that's right. Three years of data taking. Yeah. Uh, and and then uh, on, on the right, I'm just showing you um, a dipole. So these are very big dipoles, fifteen meters long. I don't remember how many ton it weighs. And these are superconducting uh, uh, magnets that deliver a magnetic field uh, above uh, eight Tesla. And, and on the top, it's just uh, uh, the, the, the tunnel buried under the surface with the different experiments, Atlas, CMS, LHCB, ALICE, and SPS and the rest of the injectors. Um, okay, I, I want to show you also that at the LHC, uh, there, was, there is a phenomenon that is uh, a, a bit annoying. It is due to the uh, high luminosity that we try to reach, uh, but at each uh, bunch crossing, um, uh, bunches of 10 to the 11th proton uh, collide, and within this bunch crossing, there are more than one uh, PP uh, collisions. 
So you can see, for example, here from round one at the bottom, uh, candidate Z to E with 19 additional uh, PP collisions that you can recognize as the, the point where the, the tracks are originating from. And you can see that these are distributed along the, along the beam and that's how uh, we can recognize them because we have their um, uh, de tracking detector with a very good resolution. Uh, this phenomenon is related, as I mentioned, to the instantaneous luminosity. And on the top left, you have the distribution of the, um, the evolution of the instantaneous luminosity for all the data that were taken at the LHC, uh, starting from run one up to the end of run two that you can see here. And you can see the slopes also uh, with uh, this evolution. Um, for the run two, uh, you have on the top right a distribution of the number of uh, PP collision per bench crossing. And you can see that uh, in average, it was 33 collisions, um, uh, PP collision at each bench crossing. So you need to uh, tell that apart to, to do your analysis. Uh, at the LHC, there are, as I mentioned, there are uh, four experiments, two uh, general purpose, ATLAS and CMS, ALICE, which is specialized for FDI and collisions, and LHCB, which is a single arm detector uh, specialized for uh, uh, B physics. Um, on the bottom, you have um, a, a sketch of the ATLAS detector. And so it, it's about the same uh, cylindrical um, uh, geometry and in, in the center tracking detectors um, and um, then calorimeters and uh, at, the, uh, at the outer parts, uh, a muon spectrometer. Here you have also some performances in terms of uh, resolutions for the tracking, for the calorimetry and um, and the, the muon uh, system. Um, on the top right, uh, I show you also a sketch of how the, the interplay between the, all the, the different subdetectors can help us identify the particles. So for example, if you take uh, um, a particle which, has, which leaves a track, it means uh, it's a charged particle and then showers in the EM calorimeter, this is likely to be an electron. Um, if you have the same uh, uh, EM shower, but with no tracks associated, this is likely to be um, a photon. Uh, the hadrons will traverse all the EM calorimeter. They may start their shower there, but most of the shower will develop in hadron uh, calorimeter. Here again, if you have an associated track, it might be a particle, I don't know, like a, a proton or a kaon. And if it, it doesn't have a track, it could be something like a neutron. And then you have a um, particle like the muon. It's essentially a heavier cousin of the electron with 200 more um, inertia. So it traverses all these detectors and just leave hits in the muon spectrometer. And then there are particles that we do not see. In the standard model, it's essentially the neutrino. They, they only interact weakly, and so it, there is not enough matter in our detector for them to, to interact. Um, sometimes they can even traverse the, the whole Earth without interacting, so you figure that uh, the Atlas detector is not enough for that. And you can only infer uh, in the transverse plane uh, the presence of neutrino by an unbalance of the momentum in the transverse uh, plane. Um, also something which is uh, present for E plus E minus collision, but is really crucial for PP collision is the online selection known as the trigger. On the left-hand plot, you have, um, as a function of the center of mass energy, you have uh, the, the cross-section of different uh, processes. 
um, of the standard model and the the on the left hand side on the right hand side sorry uh, you have this uh, cross-section axis which is converted in event rates and you can see that the total cross-section is really orders of magnitude of processes that are really of interest to us you can look for example at top production its boson production with, with different mass hypothesis these are really orders of magnitude below the total cross-section and there is no way to collect just all of the these um, these data and write that to tape uh, so there, there is i won't enter into the detail but there is a, a system with um, uh, different levels that select uh, interesting events online and finally write this uh, to tape only at the last part of the uh, this system which is called the event filter there is a first uh, reconstruction of the complete event and i want to uh, finish the first part about the, the accelerator uh, instruments by showing you also a panorama of the future colliders which are being uh, uh, intensively uh, discussed now so um, you might have so at the LHC, as you know, in 2012, the main discovery, the Eight Light, was the discovery of the Higgs boson. Right. So the LHC can already do an impressive uh, work in uh, measuring the, the property of these particles, but you would need really um, a new environment, cleanest environment, to reduce the systematic uncertainty and to really have the maximum of um, clean events with uh, uh, a good statistic about the Higgs to really uh, continue this work and gain um, uh, gain precision in the in measuring the property of the of this boson and so um, the, the the there is a consensus now in the high energy physics community that the next machine to be built should be a E plus E minus collider. And essentially you have two big techniques, either linear, it could be the ILC in Japan that you have the sketch on the top left here, or the click at CERN, or you can have also circular machines like the FCC, which is a CERN project. There is about the equivalent uh, with the CEPC that could be uh, constructed in China. And I also mentioned the muon collider, but the technology for this uh, is uh, less mature. And so it will really be a E plus E minus uh, a collider, which will be the, the next machine. And on the bottom, you have um, a plot uh, of the luminosity that you can achieve at these different machines as a function of the center of mass energy. And essentially the message here is that um, at, at low energy, you can have really uh, very large um, uh, luminosities at circular machines. Uh, and, uh, and, but uh, for example, the advantage of a linear collider is really that they can push uh, up uh, more easily uh, with the energy because they really have modest uh, uh, instantaneous luminosity um, at low energy. For example, if you want to run at the um, uh, Higgs pole or the uh, HZ threshold to study the Higgs, then they, they might have the advantage of the polarization like the LHC, where the circular machine will have a very uh, big advantage of uh, luminosity. Um, to finish with this, I just give you a few features of uh, accelerators and detectors. So um, if you remember my first lecture, I was uh, showing you three uh, lenses to, uh, to study matter at small scale. And somehow the accelerator are the instrument uh, that actually provides you the high energy lens that enables you through the, uh, the broad uh, wavelengths to really probe matter at small scale due to the large momentum that the accelerator provides. Uh, 
And so you have essentially, as you know, two ways of using these beams, either on fixed target with a center of mass given like this as a function of the mass of the particle and the energy of the beam, or in collider, which is more efficient as you can see. Um, the, the basic definition of the instantaneous luminosity is given like this. If you have, for example, in each beam n particle and a revolution frequency, which is f, uh, then the luminosity will be given by this formula, uh, where uh, in first approximation, for example, you can think uh, as a Gaussian distribution for the density of the um, of the beam uh, along the x and the y uh, direction, and you get this uh, uh, formula for the luminosity. You can integrate that over time, and this is the integrated luminosity. And what is important is that given the luminosity and the cross-section of a given process, you can calculate the rate of the events uh, for this process. Um, it's just the cross-section times in the instantaneous luminosity. And you can get also the total number of events that you will get there by multiplying the cross-section uh, by the integrated luminosity. Um, essentially, for the detectors, what you should know is that the, 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 there are essentially two strategies, one for the trackers and the other for the calorimeters. For the tracker, what you want is to measure the tra trajectory essentially of the uh, charged particle by presenting to the, uh, these high energy particle low uh, density material that will just leave heat, but uh, uh, perturbate as less as possible the trajectory of, of this particle. Um, on the contrary, for the calorimeters, the idea is to present to the uh, impinging particle dense material so that they interact a lot with them and uh, by different processes of shower, they finally lose all of the, their energy there and you get a signal which is proportional to the energy. Um, it, there are different figure of merits. I won't go into the details for the detector, the resolution that I already mentioned. The granularity is also important to tell apart different close by uh, particle in, um, in, uh, in space. Um, uh, you have the hermeticity, which is important, for example, for measuring uh, missing ET. And uh, as I mentioned, the trigger is something really important at Hadron colliders. So now, even if it might be a bit surprising, I will tell you about the Higgs search as it was done at lab two. So the main process was the Higgs problem. So it's this diagram here. Uh, you, uh, e plus E minus gives you an off shell Z that uh, eventually decay to an on shell Z and a Higgs. Um, and you, you have uh, the typical cross section for that at the highest energy achieved by the left. Uh, at the time, this search uh, uh, made the hypothesis of mass of 115 GeV. We now know that it's 10 GeV more. And, and you have here the cross section as a function of the heat mass. So there is a second process, but which was not the, the main one. For the decay modes, um, uh, at the time for this mass, the dominant was the uh, mode was uh, Higgs decay into GV bar with 74%. Now we know that it's 58% uh, because uh, the mass is a bit higher than that. But uh, it's still the dominant uh, decay mode for the Higgs. So in this context, beta again, of course, is something crucial. Uh, from the HZ decay, you can figure out uh, four uh, different um, event uh, uh, search topology. Uh, either the Higgs, for example, is decaying in DD bar and the Z in, in quarks, so this makes you a four jet uh, topology, or the Z in neutrino and Higgs to DD bar, so you have here two aquaplanar B jets. Uh, or you can have the Z decaying into leptons. Here, by leptons, we mean electrons or, or muons, and the X decaying to B. Or you can have the tau's 
coming in from the size of the Z or the, the Higgs boson. Um, here on the right, you have um, a, a plot showing you the cross section of the different processes, uh, background processes uh, with respect to the Higgs search. And you had, for example, uh, QQ and possibly radiative return as with the emission of a photon. And then uh, passing the threshold for, of twice the mass of the W, you start producing W pairs. And the same appears with Z pairs here. And you can see that the Higgs uh, production cross section is just this small, tiny thing here, orders of magnitude below this main background. So I will just detail uh, one channel here the B bar, mu nu bar channel. So the press selection uh, was requiring to have a high. Uh, uh, di B uh, mass, a large missing mass as well, because at an E plus E minus collider, you can calculate the missing mass and a small acolinearity. Um, there was a, a kinematic fit made to improve the resolution on the BE bar reconstruction. And the constraint here was that the missing mass should uh, peak at the Z mass. Um, most of the uh, different uh, variables used to discriminate um, the signal from the background were uh, given an, as input with the B-tagging for the two jets uh, into a neural network. And uh, the, it was in the end the combination of the neural network output and the reconstructed Higgs mass from a 4C fit that was used. And you have the distribution on the right hand side here of the the b tagging um, uh, the b tagging discriminant, the reconstructed mass, and you can see the histogram in triangle is, is the signal, the missing mass at the bot bottom, and the neural net output. And you can see that the, these uh, discriminate in shape the signal from the background. Um, in the end, for this channel in the L3 uh, analysis, there were five events observed uh, for 3.3 expected, and the number of signal expected was uh, just uh, 0.7 or so. Um, the systematic uncertainty ranges uh, up to 6% uh, uh, for the signal and 15% for the background, the main sources being the limited Monte Carlo statistics and, and the B-tagging. And you can see, for example, in the uh, right uh, plot, the, the exclusion limit that was set by the L3 experiment. Combining the four uh, lab experiment, it pushed that uh, a bit further by a couple of GeV, but essentially it was a, a negative result. I was telling you about the uh, Higgs because as I've shown you, in model like grand unification, uh, supersymmetry, uh, string theory, etc., there are Higgs, even more than in the standard model. And for example, in the MSSM, you can combine uh, different searches with different processes like HZ that I just described, and also uh, the small Higgs produced in association with the pseudo scalar Higgs. And for example, for the HZ, you can combine by uh, correcting the, the cross section by the, the right factor, um, depending on um, SUSY parameters. Um, now we can see um, the, the search for, for the Z prime. And the, you have the, the production uh, Feynman diagram at the top, where, where the Z prime decay into a pair, a dilepton pair. Um, of course, these, if there are electrons and muons, are visible decay product. So it's really trivial to figure that the, the signal will peak at the Z, Z prime mass over, over a, a smooth background. So this is a bump out, uh, you're really looking for a resonance there that you reconstruct just using the, the standard invariant mass, which is um, uh, the, the energy squared minus momentum squared, uh, and you take the square root of that. 
neglecting the, the masses, you get uh, this formula with the energy of the leptons and uh, the angle in space between the, the two leptons. And you can use that to, to search, for example, for dilepton resonance uh, that appear in some gut or also uh, because in Randall syndrome, you're looking for narrow resonances, you can use the same, same type of techniques. Um, so here I uh, try to describe rapidly an atlas um, analysis that was made at the beginning uh, of run two with the data of 2015. Um, the events were uh, selected online with uh, um, either a dielectron uh, trigger with a, a threshold of 17 GeV for the transverse momentum of the electron or a single neuron with different thresholds. Offline, um, it was required to have two opposite signs, same flavor, isolated lepton with a PT larger than 30 GeV. And the final discriminant used in the analysis was the invariant mass of the, the dilepton. Um, and the sensitivity uh, to the, the signal depends crucially on the hypothesis that you make with um, the width of the, the Z prime. And this is, of course, model dependent. So I won't discuss that too much, but uh, it's, it's something important. What you can see at the bottom is the invariant mass distribution of the electron on the left-hand side and muon on the right-hand side. And you can see, uh, for example, here that there is a experimentally, you see a big uh, difference in resolution uh, in favor of the electron at, at high energies here compared to the new one where the peak is much broader. Um, but it's important to have the peak as narrow as possible be, uh, is so as to discriminate it from uh, fluctuations that you might have uh, for, the, for the data. Um, so the uh, um, no excess was found with respect to the expectation of the standard model. So um, uh, exclusion limit could be drawn. And here you have uh, the experimental observation here. The dashed line is the expected uh, uh, confidence level. The green band represents plus or minus one sigma um, uh, with respect to the expected and two sigma for the, for the yellow band. And you have here uh, three different Z, Z prime with different couplings. Um, and you can see the, the limit uh, is in the TV range, about above 14 V. Um, you can do the same uh, in searching for a W prime. But uh, as you can see in the um, uh, Feynman diagram here, you will have one um, charged lepton and then a neutrino. So you have a missing ET here. And so you cannot reconstruct the, the complete mass. For that, um, uh, transverse mass was introduced and is defined like this, essentially uh, the same as uh, the invariant mass, but based on transverse uh, quantities, transverse energy and transverse momentum, which are only um, Lorentz invariant with respect to a boost along the, the beam directions, not, in, uh, not along all directions. Um, uh, the, the end, so at the uh, Hadron Collider, you can only calculate uh, the missing momentum in the transverse plane. The reason is that the particle you collide in the first place, the protons are not elementary. They are, uh, they are made of quarks and, and gluons. And uh, within uh, a single PP, and it could be the same in PP bar collision, uh, uh, the hard scattering is due to a hard collision between two particles. Let's say a quark in one proton and a gluon, for example, in the second. But you don't know. Uh, which part of the energy of the proton, the quark, and the gluon has been carried, uh, carrying. And the, this fraction uh, is in general different between the, these two particles and changes from an event to, to the other. So essentially, it means that you don't know 
the initial um, P, um, PZ for, for, the, for the partons that really make the hard collision. And therefore, you cannot apply the, the momentum conservation there. You can only apply it in the transverse plane. That's why you will get um, the, this delta phi, the difference in azimuth between the direction of the left turn and the neutrino in this formula. And so again, you can make a, a selection based here on a single left turn trigger. Um, and um, you have the uh, transverse mass uh, distribution for the electron on the left and the, um, the muon on the right. This is an analysis by, by CMS, uh, also at the beginning of, the, of run two. Uh, they didn't find the uh, excesses, so they could uh, derive uh, exclusion limits close to uh, four uh, TV uh, for each channel. And by combining, they would gain a bit, uh, not so much, uh, um, uh, the order of 100 uh, uh, GV for this exclusion limit. Uh, now we can try to see um, how to look uh, at the LHC for, for supersymmetric uh, particles. I took the uh, two example, one of uh, um, strong uh, SUSY production. So this mimics uh, QCD but uh, with uh, squawks and gluons. And I will also uh, mention uh, SUSY electroweak production. So um, the particles um, uh, that uh, undergo uh, strong interactions are the, the squawks. And for the first and second generation, they are essentially degenerated in mass. And for the third generation, since there could be uh, large mixing, you can have, for example, light stops or, or light bottoms. Uh, here you have different uh, leading order diagram um, to show you how the, the squawks and duinos are produced by pair. Um, for the electroweak, you know, so these are the, the partners of the um, um, uh, gauge boson and Higgs boson in, in, in SUSY. Uh, you have uh, the charginos and the neutralinos, but uh, here we also consider the case of uh, a slepton production, even though, as you will see later, they have a, a smaller uh, production cross section. So you have all these graphs, and here, for example, for the I think it's for the sleptons, you also have Feynman graph of the uh, one loop correction to that with real emission and virtual emissions. Um, so the state of the art to calculate those cross section is uh, um, it at fixed order next to leading order uh, with all the QCD corrections and a resummation of uh, next to leading logs. And so here, as a function of the particle mass, you have the cross section that you can see are dominated by uh, uh, strong uh, interactions, as we might expect. So green no pair, squawk pair, uh, uh, stops. And then you have uh, the electric uh, processes that will depend, for example, the, the dominant process in the electric SUSY charging one, neutralino two but uh, the cross-section depends on the mixing of, of this particle with the different components. Um, you can also uh, study the, the different possibility of decays of these strong particles. For example, here the score can decay directly to uh, the lightest neutralino, which is usually the lightest supersymmetric particle. And I remind you that the, in the MSSM, it is uh, supposed to be a stable particle, a very good candidate for dark matter. Uh, the gluino will decay um, in, in free body like this, but you can have a longer cascade that will produce uh, different uh, uh, quarks or possibly even leptons in the cascade decay. Um, in general, you have shorter uh, decay chains for the electroweakino, which are also uh, in general lighter. 
uh, once you've de uh, determined the um, decay chains you're interested in, from that you can um, choose uh, a search topology. And the, in this example of spark production that decay to two quarks and two neutralinos, you can uh, uh, naturally uh, start the, your study by two ap apoplanar jets and, and missing it. But in, in your topology in general, you might have uh, many different type of objects and you can even split categories of the jets by applying some B tagging or uh, tau, the uh, adronic tau tagging, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, so uh, here you have um, a transfer view of what uh, an aquaplanar uh, die jet plus missing ET events would look like. Uh, so this is a transfer view of the detector, and you can see that the two jets are, are going to one hemisphere, and on the other hemisphere there is nothing, so essentially that's uh, where the missing uh, vector would uh, point in the transfer screen. Um, something that you need to consider and have in mind also is that in your SUSY spectra, there are uh, masses at different points, for example, for the gluino and squark, and then the electroequino tend to be in general uh, lighter. And for your cascade decay, uh, the, the jet, for example, which is emitted, uh, will depend on the, on the mass difference there are uh, in between the two states uh, uh, where it's emitted in, in, in this cascade. So if the, the, um, the masses are close by, then the object uh, uh, emitted uh, as intermediate uh, will in general be uh, soft. And if you want to have a high PT object, you need to have uh, large mass differences. Um, okay, uh, usually for uh, many analyses at the LHC, we use uh, variables that you can see here. So first of all, you have the, the beam, uh, uh, which is uh, along the, essentially the, the axis uh, of the detector. Um, and you have a phi in the transverse plane as an angle, and uh, theta is the inclination angle with respect to, to the beam line. And you can uh, define um, the rapidity of the particle. It's the y here. When it's the particle is ultra relativistic, that means you can neglect the mass uh, over the energy. You can use a pseudo rapidity defined directly with the theta angle here. And in space, in order to tell apart the different direction uh, where the particle are emitted, you can. Um, look at their difference in pseudo rapidity and in phi, and you can even measure an angular difference like this, if they, which is this delta r. And often in um, topologies with jets, we uh, want to make sure that the missing ET in the event uh, is not uh, coming from a mismeasurement of the jets. So in general, you tend to uh, require that the delta phi between uh, any jet and the missing ET be larger than uh, some down. Uh, I want to present you a bit uh, more variables uh, which are linked to uh, supersymmetry, but could also be applied to uh, other uh, searches. Uh, for example, you can guess um, the typical mass of the new physics you're looking at by uh, um, calculating this effective mass is just the um, uh, sum, uh, scalar sum of the PTs of the different objects you have in, in your event. And typically, for example, if you, in SUSY, you're interested in the production of uh, Gluino and Squarks, the, uh, uh, the effective mass will give you something uh, uh, related to the minimum between the Gluino and, and the squawk mass. It can also be used, for example, for studies like Z going to, to uh, Z prime going to TT bar. And you can see in this plot the correlation between the true uh, TT bar mass uh, um, and uh, this effective mass, which is HT. Uh, the first term here, uh, scalar sum of the PT of the jet plus the missing ET uh, 
in this topology, which was uh, fully adrenic for this example. Um, in, in SUSY, there is also a, a very smart uh, variable that was designed by, by these people, these British people, which is the stranger's mass, which is some kind of um, um, extrapolation of the transverse mass that we have seen, for example, for the W prime search. Uh, the, the definition of the, this uh, transverse mass MT2 is uh, here. Essentially, what you'll do is to divide uh, your event into uh, two different hemispheres with a part of energy which is visible and uh, the mass of um, the end particle, for example, the lightest neutralino in SUSY here, which would be a, a trial. So what you do is to separate these in two and uh, distribute the missing ET vector into the two hemisphere and calculate the minimum of this uh, uh, distribution. Uh, over the maximum of the transverse mass calculated with the feasible uh, part in one hemisphere and the attributed uh, missing ET uh, contribution uh, given the, the, the uh, invisible particle mass that entered the transverse mass calculation in this way. Because in this case, uh, this, uh, this mass cannot be neglected. Um, this generally gives um, uh, an upper bound on the parent uh, uh, mass. Um, the, so the, you, will, you will find an edge in the MT2 distribution, as you can see on the, um, the plot uh, right here. Uh, when, so for example, this is a TT bar. Um, um, these are TT bar events in the dilaton channel. When you make the right uh, assignment for B and the corresponding lepton, you find an edge in this distribution, and where you, you have the wrong combinatories, you have this, uh, this red histogram. But th this edge is something very important because it gives you uh, information about the mass of the parent particle. And then there is an additional property of these is that um, if you change the, the hypothesis of the invisible particle mass, you have the plot on the bottom here, and you have essentially two trends when, uh, the, when you are below this mass in reality or above this mass, and you can see that the, the, there is a kink where uh, the, 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 this variable will change slope. And at the precise point where it changes slope, it enables you to measure on the vertical axis the mass of the parent particle and on, um, and on the, the x-axis the mass of the invisible particle. So in case you really discover something, um, uh, SUSY or whatever else, uh, DSM physics uh, with this MT2 variable, it can give you access to very important uh, uh, characteristic of this new physics. So, uh, so here I want to present you a surge that uses this uh, stranger's mass, MT2. Um, so it's a surge of squawk and gluinos in a topology where you only have jets, uh, no lepton and some missing T. The main background there are uh, Z plus jet with Z decaying to neutrino and W plus jet, where the W is decaying to, to a lepton and neutrino, but the lepton is misreconstructed and, or completely missed. And then you have also have some background from TT bar and, and QCD. So this was um, the, the second part of uh, run one here uh, in, in CMS, uh, people who did this analysis. So essentially they are looking at the uh, multi-jet plus missing ET um, uh, topology. Uh, they require, in order to suppress um, um, background that would come from a mismeasurement uh, of the jet energy, as I mentioned, a delta phi between the, the jets and the missing ET. And then they split up their signal regions um, with respect to the number, total number of jets in the events and total number of D-jets in the events. 
and you have uh, different categories of events with high um, HD, medium or low HD. Um, uh, you can see distribution of the MT2 for these different category of events, and you can see that you have a bit of room in between uh, data and Monte Carlo. When you look uh, more closely at uh, each um, signal uh, regions, you can see that you have um, uh, more or less uh, taking into account the full um, uncertainty, a good agreement, a few excesses here and there, but not uh, really significant. And since you don't have a sim significant excess, uh, you can <coughs> derive uh, exclusion limits. Um, and so here, for example, you have limits in the plane of um, uh, the gluino uh, versus the, the, the uh, neutralino. Okay, so for you can also uh, look at uh, dilatant uh, edges when you produce, for example, electroweekino. And here we look at the direct uh, uh, production of chargino 1 to neutralino 2, which will decay to prelapton and missimity. And in this case, uh, the dilatant edge, depending on the, um, uh, the way the decay of this particle proceed, can be given either by this formula, if you have slepton as intermediate between the, char the chargino 1, neutralino 2, and the LSP, or if it's a direct three-body decay, you simply have the mass difference between these two guys. And you can see on the right hand side how these distribution look, and you see the clearly visible when the background is subtracted the edge in this uh, in the invariant mass distribution of uh, two lepton. Um, the the production mechanism. Uh, uh, so here I will describe uh, an analysis looking for. Um, Electroweekino in Atlas in run two, the two first year of run two uh, is a data set. The integrated luminosity is uh, 36 inverse femtobar. And here you look at the production of um, uh, chargino pairs with decay via uh, intermediate slaptons or uh, chargino one neutralino two that will decay in WZ and in the end, in a trilepton transmissivity uh, signal. I will concentrate on the, on the later analysis. So the event topology is uh, three um, um, charge, isolated and hard lepton transmissivity. The main background obviously comes from the standard model WZ in trilepton. Uh, the events are selected online using a D-lepton trigger. And then you can make um, different um, uh, signal regions. So you just divide the phase space of your analysis in these different bins, depending on the mass of the same flavor and opposite sign uh, by lepton, the missing T and other quantities. Um, when you look um, at the comparison between data and Monte Carlo, in all of your different uh, signal regions, you can see that you don't have uh, significant excesses. Most of the excesses are less, or, or even deficits are less than, than two sigma. Um, and therefore, you can calculate exclusion limits. And here is the table with, for the three lepton um, analysis at, at, the both, at the bottom. And you can see the Zn is giving you, the Z, sorry, is giving you essentially the significance of any uh, possible excess. And you can see that at most is something like uh, 1.8 uh, uh, sigma as a local significance. And so you can derive um, exclusion limits in this plane here with uh, uh, the mass of the second uh, neutralino or the first chargino versus the mass of the LSP. Um, and as you can see, the sensitivity is easier along this line because here 
this is somehow the kinematic limit for this type of analysis. Here you have a large uh, mass difference. So you have objects that are quite boosty and closer to the diagonal. It's more difficult to have um, sensitivity because uh, the objects are softer. And so you don't have uh, much efficiency um, in your events there. You can follow, if you're interested, uh, the latest uh, SUSI result from the LHC as these two links from the Atlas and CMS collaboration. Now we can uh, move to um, one search for a large extra dimension uh, that was also uh, realized with the two first year of data of run two. Um, here it's a search for monojets. So, so typically you will have a Feynman diagram where you produce a graviton versus another um, uh, colored particle, either a quark or, or a gluon. Um, and so the graviton will go to um, the for, to, into an extra dimension and you're left in your detector with the presen presence of just the one uh, monojet typically. Um, and so here that uh, the events are selected online based on a missingity trigger where you require uh, uh, online a threshold of 90 GeV. Um, since this is based essentially on the jets that you have in your event, so it's multi-jet plus missing ET, uh, this multi-jet don't have a very good resolution and offline you cut much harder uh, to account for this resolution to really be on a plateau of efficiency for your trigger. So the offline cut on missing ET is 250 GeV. You place this cut to require that uh, Mismeasurement of jet doesn't artificially create this missing ET. You want to have uh, a few jets up to four, but especially the leading one, which is really high PT. And then you vet to uh, possible isolated uh, lepton in your events. And here they design uh, different uh, signal regions, either inclusive or exclusive, based on these uh, uh, bins or uh, just the lower bound of the value of the missing ET. You can see the distribution of the data compared to the prediction. And you can see that uh, overall, we have a good uh, description of the data. Uh, here you have the missing ET, the PT of the leading jet, the pseudo rapidity of the leading jet, and the, the jet multiplicity in the events. You have some kind of a trend in both a missing ET and jet multiplicity that you cannot see in the log plot, but in the ratio plot. But overall, it, when you compare with the uh, total uncertainty, uncertainty band, it's uh, uh, fully compatible with uh, what is uh, expected. Um, so uh, here you have for the exclusion, uh, exclusive uh, signal regions, uh, the composition of the background, and you can see that in all cases, the dominant one is uh, Z plus jet with the Z going to, into neutrino. Um, in the bottom table, you can compare the observed number of events over the prediction, and you can see that uh, uh, they are essentially in agreement, uh, which enables to place uh, different uh, exclusion limits in this uh, ADD model um, with uh, depending on the number of uh, extra dimension that you support there. Um, the main systematic that enter into this limit calculation come from the integrated luminosity um, uh, three, about uh, 3%. And then for the background, the dominant part comes from uh, jet energy scale, jet energy resolution, missing ET scale, and they can go up to something like uh, 5%. But then when you sum up with all the other uncertainty, you can go up for your um, uh, largest missing ET uh, bin uh, signal region to something like 10% on, on the background. And here you have um, a limit plot on the um, uh, effective uh, Planck mass. It's a lower limit on the ex uh, effective Planck mass in, in TEV versus the number of uh, extra dimensions. 
Okay, now we will still be using accelerator based uh, experiment, but this time it's no longer uh, a collider. And here we will discuss um, about uh, the measurement of the anomalous magnetic moment of the moon. So uh, first I will introduce uh, the, the idea. So uh, what we want is to measure the, this uh, uh, magnetic uh, uh, moment for the muon. It can be related to the, um, um, how do you call it in English, orbital uh, momentum, uh, which is calculated like, like this. And um, the, you have this magnetic moment due to the spin of the particle. And in, um, in the Dirac equation, you can show that uh, this factor here is supposed to be exactly two. Uh, what is measured um, uh, is slightly above two, and the difference between this number and two is called the anomalous part of the magnetic moment. So you can measure it in, um, excuse me, charge pi and decay into muons. Um, and in this case, the muon will eventually decay uh, to an electron. Uh, if the muons are polarized, then the electron will also carry uh, in their kinematics uh, information about the, the spin directions. Um, you, in, in order to calculate the, the, the value of this factor, you need not only to uh, take care of the three level, but also uh, from higher order corrections. And you can do that in the framework of the standard model alone. This is the top part with these different uh, correcting uh, diagrams, or also in the framework of uh, BSM uh, physics like supersymmetry in the bottom here. And here you have all types of corrections uh, of these uh, two muon legs uh, from QED by exchanging a, a, a photon from a, a weak interaction by exchanging uh, a Z and also by the um, vacuum polari hadronic polarization of the vacuum or so-called light by light uh, interactions. And this can be calculated quite precisely uh, up to um, uh, several loops um, in, in the standard model. So this experiment was uh, carried first at, um, at BNL, the lab of uh, Ketevi. Now it has moved to a Fermi lab. I did not update my, my slide, but I just want to show you the principle of, of this experiment. Uh, first, you produce your uh, pion beam by shooting protons on a fixed target. Um, you uh, select uh, pions uh, coming out of this with a momentum of about uh, 3 GeV. This pion will decay into muons that you um, uh, deflect in order to, for them to enter this uh, storage ring. Um, and in the decay, if you look at, in the pion uh, uh, rest strain, it will decay into a muon neutrino and a, a charged muon, but with uh, opposite spin, um, since the, the pion itself has a, has a zero spin. What will happen is that um, there will be a precession of the spin about the momentum, and if you uh, plunge this uh, storage ring into a magnetic field, then you will have a relation between the frequency of this precession and the anomalous magnetic moment. And if you choose a specific energy, you can completely cancel the effect of uh, any electric uh, field. And that's why this uh, momentum here for the new one is called uh, uh, some kind of magic energy. Then you just need to know precisely the B field and you can extract from this uh, precession um, uh, frequency the anomalous uh, magnetic moment. 
Uh, okay, now if you look at the comparison between the theoretical prediction that you have on the top right with experiment, you can see that the, both are extremely precise, but there is a tension between the two. Um, so uh, you have that on the plot in the bottom. The red entries are what is measured, what was measured at the time for uh, positive muons and negative muons. Both are in agreement and you can average them to this point. Um, and then you could calculate the prediction uh, for, um, uh, from the theory. Um, at the time, there was even in the prediction for the theory a disagreement with what came from E plus E minus and tau decays about the um, uh, contribution to uh, vacuum polarization. This has resolved with time, so you can forget essentially this being with the tau, but you see between the measurement and the theoretical prediction, a tension of the order of three sigma. And so now everybody is awaiting the new result um, that would that should uh, come out of Fermilab uh, may, maybe in a few months from now. Um, and now I will finish uh, by looking at uh, some uh, BSM uh, ideas without uh, accelerator. And first I will introduce the concept of dark matter because I didn't uh, talk about this in the first lecture. Um, so the easiest way to understand and maybe the most uh, convincing uh, argument about the existence of uh, dark matter comes from um, these rotation curves from, um, from galaxy spiral, even elliptic galaxy would work. So the idea here is that you plot the distance from the center of the galaxy for all of these given stars, and uh, you plot this against their uh, rotation velocity. Uh, here, everything, uh, you can check that you can apply Newtonian mechanics, and what Newtonian mechanics would predict is that this velocity, as you go away from the center of the galaxy, will start to rise, and then attain a given uh, value and then start decreasing with this um, uh, velocity law where the mass here is um, depends on r because it's all the mass contained within the, the three gaps. Uh, this is really what is um, um, uh, foreseen by Newtonian mechanics. Um, now, when you uh, do the observation, you find that faraway stars somehow turn too fast, as if they uh, felt more gravitational attraction than just the visible star. So people started to think that uh, maybe beyond the, the stars that we see through their light, there might be, uh, you know, some gas or dust or stuff like that that could add up to this, but they are not dense enough and they cannot uh, really explain this big difference between the, uh, the expected behavior and what is observed, which is essentially a, a plateau uh, in this behavior. And the, the most convincing way to explain this is the presence of a halo of dark matter, which you can see here as a, as a company. So um, I will not really enter this. I, I think it's not really essential. Maybe just to introduce the concept of relic density for dark matter. Um, you can, um, if you wind back the, the history of the universe, at the beginning is what it was very hot. So for example, here you had the temperature which, which was uh, much larger than the mass of the, uh, of the particle uh, that constitute dark matter. And so you had uh, a density for this particle which were proportional to the temperature of the third power. And as the uh, universe expanded, at some point you reach a temperature that was lower from this mass. And then you start to decrease exponentially 
the, the density for this uh, dark matter particle. And at some point, you can plug all of this in a uh, Bos Boltzmann equation. Um, uh, one factor will be due directly to the expansion of the universe, and the other factor uh, will be due to the annihilation of the particle. But this annihilation depends also on the, on the density of this particle and their relative uh, velocity and on the annihilation cross-section. And this can give you, um, at some point, where when the universe is just uh, um, too uh, diluted, if you will, uh, the, the living uh, dark matter particle don't meet, meet each other uh, sufficiently uh, uh, frequently, and then you somehow freeze the density uh, at a, a given stage here, and which would explain why nowadays you might have a particle that were really produced or in equilibrium uh, close to the Big Bang, but still leave some weight density today. Uh, one way to, to search for that is to, to analyze the cosmic microwave background, and this was done over decades by different uh, experiments, radio telescopes here, uh, probably satellite WMAP, and there is an even more uh, precise measurement by the Planck satellite. Um, here, I don't see. If, I don't know if you can see, for example, uh, this peak here, which is a uh, angular uh, spe uh, spectral analysis of this uh, uh, microwave background that can give you uh, different in in information about the. The distribution of the of the of the dark matter uh, in the first stage. I'm sorry, this doesn't uh, read very nicely. But essentially, from this, you can measure the density, the contribution uh, to the density coming from the baryon and uh, the, uh, coming from the matter. And by doing the difference, you get the, the density that you can associate with, with dark matter. Uh, by doing such analysis, you can um, uh, get to the um, distribution of matter and energy um, in uh, doing some uh, cosmological um, um, uh, fit, fit of um, of data and, and doing so, for example, with the uh, general relativity as a model, you would find that the universe is made of about three quarter of dark energy um, and then 22% uh, of dark matter and the usual matter is something down to four or five percent. And here you have a constraint on the density coming from dark matter. So how can you look for dark matter? There are essentially three uh, ways that are complementary. Uh, we have seen one, which is this. So here it's essentially a Feynman diagram um, where some kind of effective model, if you will, uh, where, for example, you can start, if you start from this side and collide two standard model particles to produce two dark matter particles in the final state, that's typically what you would do at a collider. You could also take the collision of a dark matter particle into standard um, uh, matter and see uh, and study the, the scattering of that. Uh, this is a, a direct detection, and we will see that in a, in a sketch in, a, in one minute. And then there is one last thing, is to study the product of annihilation of dark matter into standard model particle, and this is the principle of indirect detection. So direct detection is represented here. You have your experiment, which is a tank uh, uh, containing different um, uh, detectors. The dark matter from the aloe uh, will uh, collide onto a nucleus of this matter and scatter of that. This is a principle of the experiment like Lux, Xenon, dark side, etc. For indirect detection, 
you rely on different spots, like for example, the center of the sun or the center of the galaxy, whereby gravitational um, attraction, lots of uh, particle making up the dark matter will concentrate. And then here they will find again sufficient density to annihilate, uh, for example, producing neutrino that you will try to measure in some detector like, uh, I don't know, Ice Cube or Antares came to net, etc. If you want a signal, for example, with photons, you will turn up to a detector like S or CTA. Um, Okay, the search hypothesis for the dark matter is that there is a halo in a galaxy and it's static with respect to the, gal the galactic uh, framework, whereas the sun turns around this with um, a turn around the center of the galaxy with a velocity which is something of the order of 200 kilometers per second. And the Earth also uh, rotates as its contribution and depending on the time of the year, this will change the, the net uh, uh, velocity here and you will get an annual modulation in your signal. The, this can be a feature to, to figure out where, if you've de detected dark matter. So the dark matter will uh, do elastic scattering on ordinary matter and typically with a map of uh, a mass, sorry, of the uh, dark matter particle between 10 GeV and 10 TeV, you will get essentially a nuclear recoil energy uh, between one and 100 uh, keV. So you see that these energies are not very large, and that's why, um, in order to reduce the background, most of the time experiments make use of three different types of signatures. You can either have in your detector ionization or heat, phonons, or light scintillation. And most of the time, uh, you couple at least two of these technique, techniques to reduce the background. Um, here, I will just describe uh, one experiment of direct detection, which is uh, Xenon, which is placed uh, in the National Laboratory Gran Sasso in Italy, um, below a mountain uh, to, um, to shield from, from the, the cosmic muons. So it's essentially a, a dual phase uh, TPC, a time projection chamber, uh, where you have uh, liquid xenon in this part here, gaseous xenon here, and essentially what you need to do is to distinguish between um, electron recoil that can come from any particle, like for example, a photon here uh, knocking off an electron that will give a certain type of signal from a really um, a re nuclear recoil that you can, for example, simulate uh, in, um, uh, with neutron, uh, uh, with, uh, with neutron um, uh, scattering of your, your nucleon, and this is how the wind would interact. So it will give you um, um, a scintillation um, in, in, the, in the liquid here, and then uh, the electron will drift because there is a, an electric field uh, here in the liquid and here in the gas. Um, and in, uh, in, at the top and the bottom, you have an array of uh, PMTs. So since it, this is in two dimension, this will measure essentially X and Z. And then the, 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 the arrival time for your signal in your TPC will essentially measure uh, the, the Z. Uh, so you can uh, position the place where the possible uh, scatter appear. And uh, given the, the magnitude of the two different type of signal uh, in the liquid and in the gas, you can uh, discriminate between a, a nuclear recoil and an um, electron recoil. Uh, so far, uh, no signal has been found, at least for large mass WIMPs. Right now in this experiment, Xenon Mountain, they have an excess about um, 
uh, precisely electron recoil, but this is possibly for much lighter um, uh, dark matter particle. Here, uh, it was, uh, they were concentrating on, on more massive uh, and they could exclude uh, the, the different uh, wimp nuclear cross-section below, um, uh, above this line, sorry. And what you see in gray here is um, uh, a scan of uh, different SUSY models with uh, uh, the expectation. If you take, for example, the lightest neutrino to be the LSP mass of what uh, it could produce in, in this experiment. Okay, that's uh, all I have for today. I don't know if you have questions. Uh, so I see one question from yeah. um in, in the chat. So experimentally, what why is it difficult to detect neutrino? Well, because they, uh, they don't have an electric charge, it's easy to uh, detect a particle with electric charge, and they don't have a color charge either. Um, gravitation is uh, at the level of uh, elementary particle is something completely negligible. So you can think of this particle as only having weak interactions. And because this cross section is small, it's very difficult to detect neutrino. To give you an example, amongst a million neutrino traversing completely the Earth, uh, most of the time only one will interact. With the Earth's running. So you can see that in our much smaller experiment, it's extremely difficult to, to measure neutrino, and you need to have uh, large uh, fluxes of neutrino to, in order to measure something. Um, and 1.8 sigma uh, means uh, uh, deviation, possibly uh, coming from a statistical uh, fluctuation. Uh, which has a certain probability, but you would need precisely for this to know, for example, if the parent distribution is Gaussian or something in order to, to fully interpret it. But the uh, 1.8 uh, sigma is not really significant. Uh, we, we start to speak about um, uh, something interesting above three sigma once you've corrected for the look at elsewhere effect, etc. So, um, and then five sigma is really the, the standard for discovery in high energy physics. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Don't know if you have uh, other questions or comments. Uh, I have other question, if possible. Yes. Okay. So it seems like um, um, sometimes it's like um, they are uh, search for uh, for physics beyond beyond the standard model yes. by by looking at the deviation in, in the standard model interaction yes. or in the standard model. Can you, if, if possible, can you give us like uh, an overview for that or the general idea? Uh, okay, so uh, generally you, you can distinguish uh, when you want to look at deviation, if you want to have essentially deviation in rate, overall rates or shapes. Um, I don't know if you remember when I've shown um, a large extra dimension I, I mentioned that since the uh, graviton can couple with just uh, any uh, energy momentum tensor, they can essentially couple to all the particles. And therefore, if you look at production, let's say of a, a d dielectron, um, you will have graphs where uh, the graviton is also exchanged. 
which are fully compatible with, uh, for example, Q bar annihilation at the IEG. And so this will make an interference. And then if you add up to that, the gluon um, uh, initial state to produce the, the, the graviton that will also couple to a dilepton in the final state, it's additional um, um, uh, events. So um, what it means is that um, you can have both effect. Either you look at um, the shape of a distribution, uh, for example, a mass distribution or an angular distribution. You have some prediction from the standard model and you see a, a distortion in the shape. And then if it's significant, you can try to attribute that to, to new physics or you really do some kind of counting experiment, binned or not binned, it doesn't matter. And also there, um, the, the presence of a new physics interaction could also change your rates. And then if it's significant enough, larger than the fluctuation of the background, then you can, uh, if it's five sigma larger than the fluctuation of the background, there you can think uh, made a, a discovery. I don't know if it, this answers your question. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, other things? Hi, Steve. Sorry, to connect late. Um, no problem. Do you know in, if in, uh, in Africa, so there are any kind of connection as well or engagement for this stock matter search? Uh, or are they involved as well, potentially as well, with the, um, the, the CDMS? Would it be any upgrade as well of that, uh, you know? Uh, what I know is that you see, for example, there is a, an experiment of uh, indirect detection of dark matter that was started in my lab, which was called in the first phase Antares. Now it's called, called KM3Net. And what I discover is that, for example, the group of uh, Mohamed Shabab in, in Marrakesh is involved in KM3Net. And I also heard, I don't remember which one now, but I think at least one group in South Africa is also involved in KM3Net. Maybe Katerine knows. Okay, no, that's um, Yeah, there is. Um, um also uh, some of the i think some of the uh, groups uh, in ethiopia that are doing uh, um astrophysics and cosmology mm -hmm. it's a huge group um okay. that very well organized actually okay. uh, i think some of them are also involved in this uh, in these activities and there's also shaban kali uh, yeah, Shaban Khalil in Egypt, although he's a theorist, yeah, although he's a theorist, so he's more, more in the astro of his group. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, but the area mostly uh, that Africa is pushing uh, more or less, you know, in the, in the uh, astrophysics uh, parts rather than the particle astrophysics side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With the observation, like with the EHS as well, and uh, all the yeah. capacity that they have for large infrastructure there. So that's a unique value, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, yeah it's good to develop that and to have this network, yeah. yeah. Okay, I will try to record a new, the, um, the, the first lecture sometime. Uh, the time to do that and, and then post the, the mp4 uh, on the indigo page super and you could start as well i mean you could make the recording as well work yes yeah this time i, I can just uh, use my own um, uh, uh, virtual room in zoom and just uh, excellent yeah. all set Okay, so I don't know if there are uh, other um, questions or comments about the, this BSM physics. Of course, BSM is extremely large and they are part of this 
in phenomenology or even in experiment that I don't follow, that I don't know. Uh, I only spoke mainly of things I know. Maybe the bit, which is a bit newer for me, that I don't mess with too much is extra dimensions. But um, I just remind, I wanted the first lecture on phenomenology to have different theories beyond the standard model, like uh, grand unification, extra dimensions, supersymmetry, and then one set of theories like superstring or M theory that somehow couples these three uh, uh, avenues beyond the standard model. But I'm not so much uh, uh, familiarized with extra dimensions. So far, uh, excuse me. So, sorry, please. Yes. Okay, so, uh, so far it is this analysis, so uh, the latest analysis based on the, uh, the, the data of with 140 investment to buy from yes. the look for Suzy, even uh, in CMS or Atlas, and there is mm -hmm. no, 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 uh, I mean, Search. I mean, there is nothing about the Suzy. I mean, the Suzy is negative. The search is negative. Uh, concerning uh, not the, not only Suzy. Any extension of the standard model, the searches are negative so far. Um, I'm just talking about the Suzy because the Suzy is a kind of of a, a, a small portion from a big big model like two hexabit mm -hmm. model. And the Suzy right. is a specific case. And uh, so do you expect, what do you, I mean, do you expect something for run three uh, or even by increasing the luminosity? Uh, do you expect some, uh, I mean, do you expect a lot of exclusion or do you expect some discovery? Because now we can see from your plots and from the public plots from Atlas that this, the exclusion region from the for the SUSI particle has really reached the TV scale. So, um, what do so, you think that aspect? So, uh, first, I, I will uh, uh, give you maybe um, uh, you know word of caution. Most of the exclusion plot that you see are based on so-called uh, simplified models. What it means is that instead of having a full SUSY model that you could calculate, you pick uh, a few uh, states in your SUSY spectrum and you force the decay between different uh, states in this spectrum to be 100%. And this somehow decouples the work of um, uh, of uh, estimating the sensitivity of your experiment with all your data to this type of scenario. But then don't forget that this is not completely realistic. In order to be realistic in a framework of SUSY, for example, you would need to map back these simplified model onto a full theory. And, yes. and, and so you would have to wait, for example, that um, there is this MSSM effort to reinterpret in a 90 dimensional MSSM all the result of run two as it was done in Atlas for run one. And there you might have a, a better sense of the of realistic models that are really excluded because uh, when you just look at simplified models, it gives you a hint, but it's not the, the full story. So that's the, the first caution. Now, uh, as usual, and that's what we observed as well, um, once you fix the center of mass energy and just accumulate more data, usually your limit evolve quite slowly. Uh, in order to really have a gain in your sensitivity, um, the, the most paying strategy, if you can, is really increase in, the, in center of mass energy. So we are now in a situation where 
but of course, this depends also uh, if the particle that you're looking at are really at uh, some kinematic edge or not. If it is, then even a very small increase in center of mass energy can make a, a big increase in sensitivity. But for example, for in SUSY uh, with particles like sleptons or chargino and neutralino, you still can have some kind of um, continuous improvement of the uh, exclusion limit along run three, even possibly run four, et cetera. So uh, unfortunately, um, it's not a pleasant situation. We need to be uh, patient. And if we recall uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson, well, in fact, uh, between the theoretical ideas and the first paper and the discovery, it was almost 50 years. And uh, from a theoretical point of view, it's much simpler. The case of the Higgs was much simpler. So um, I think we just need to wait in the front of the colliders, but also uh, pay attention to any other uh, signal that could come from measurement of G minus two, from deviation in the physics, from, uh, you know, all the, all the sector, from possibly direct or indirect detection of dark matter. Now we're really in a stage where uh, we don't know exactly where uh, new physics will uh, publish. So, uh, yeah. Uh one more question if possible yes yeah so it's like um, um it's more than uh, like an idea so i um, as far as i understand it um so um looking beyond standard model physics is somehow <coughs> to the detector and the high energy which i think um, uh, the cell now it is 13 right 13 yes uh, that's two, right three. So, uh, would it be possible, for example, um, to in order to have like higher energy, like uh, putting a satellite, for example, in the outer space, and then and somehow implement kind of detectors, uh, so uh, it might it might result uh, it might give us a result because you know it's like they are uh, very energetic particle coming from the outer space so it's like a, a natural um, a natural source a natural, yes. a, a natural source or a natural accelerator anyway, right I'm just saying so so there are some experiments looking at these so for example mm -hmm. there was a balloon experiment called uso or there are a few others uh, but the problem also is that it's true that uh, with uh, some uh, uh, astrophysic accelerator, you can have particles at energy far beyond orders of magnitude beyond what we could do with uh, colliders, but there are only a very few of them. Cross section there is very small. Um, and so again, I think we should not neglect any of these avenues because there is no obvious place we are almost convinced new physics must exist because you yeah. need something to explain dark energy you need something to explain the dark matter dark you matter. need something to explain uh, i don't know for example the the lack of cp violation for biogenesis you need something to explain the neutrino mass Etc. Etc. You need something to somehow connect uh, gravity with the other interaction. So there are lots of things that you really uh, independently uh, makes uh, you believe strongly that there is new physics. But uh, right now we are really in this type of moments where <laughs> we essentially have no clue. I like supersymmetry. I would uh, dream of having TV scale supersymmetry, but I have just no idea whether it's there or not. I just know it's important to look, but uh, really I, I don't know. And in cases where you don't know like this, I think it's really important to look everywhere. 
Now, yeah. uh, just also one word for the future, because for example, as I mentioned, we are discussing uh, future colliders. And you know that I essentially talked about the uh, next E plus E minus, but for the circular machine that I presented at CERN or in China, so FCC, HH or SPCC, I think, uh, these are 100 TV colliders in proton proton. Oh, so, um, 100 TV. These machines are not decided yet, but it would make a, a jump uh, um, multiplied by seven the center of mass energy of the LHC and increase uh, the, the, the luminosity at least by an order of magnitude. So if we had such a machine, the, the reach for our different uh, precision studies and searches would be uh, immensely uh, uh, increased. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, um, I think if there are no more questions or comments, I thank you for connecting and I think we can stop uh, this lecture uh, here. Very good, thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, bye -bye. thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.